Hey guys, so today you and I are going to talk about applying what you read in a programming book. So let's get into it. So the question in question was, Frederick, as a software engineer, how do you go about applying what you have read in a programming book? Well, I tinker. That's what I do. I've said this on a few occasions that I believe that tinkering is the source of uh, uh, the like the over overwhelming amount of talent that exists in most of the best people that are you know that has ever lived. Tinkering is everything, like uh, because in essence it is what you could call it a scientific method or something like that. You could create, you have some new thing that you don't really know so much about, and it doesn't matter if it's something that somebody else knows everything about or if it's new to the entire race uh, of humans. It's about that you don't know exactly what's going on here. So you sort of formulate like uh, some thoughts on, you know, you try to find what available information there is, and then you kind of go, okay, let's try something. And then you kind of poke it with the stick and see and observe, like, what happened if I did that? Oh, okay. And then you reflect a bit, okay, why did that happen? And then you poke it again, and then, you know, something else happens, and then you poke it from a different angle, and you just continue that process until you start to put the pieces together if that makes sense and I truly believe that that is the, the that is the the process that has brought humans from whatever we were I don't care you know whatever you believe whatever we have been to the point where we are today everything we have today is from that exact uh, that that simple 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 thing and it's the thing that uh, you know, uh, people like uh, who are deep into hardware. That's the reason why they, you know, collect old uh, televisions or computers and like just tear everything out so they can look at the motherboard and like they. Ha I mean, I've had friends who were that, like that when I was younger. This was before I became a software developer, and I, you know, like you came home to them and they had like. It, like busted up radios and stuff like the with cables all over the place and you know like why, why, I asked them like why why, why is your room so messy they, like, there were screws and like everything everywhere right and they said oh no yeah I was just I just want to check if I if I plug this thing in I just wanted to see if I could see the current like where what where is the electricity going and like uh, setting so it could they could understand switches and stuff like that and that is I truly believe the best way for you to learn anything and so when you read something in a book for example if it is something th this is where it gets really tricky this is where it gets so 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 tricky because some things that you read are I argue more practically thing practical things and then there are things that are more conceptual like mental tools if that makes sense so a practical thing might be that you read how to use a specific programming language that would be a very simple thing and that is fairly simple enough yes I said that you can tinker you go you set your you set yourself down at like a course or something and you read something and then you go all right I'll try out what is a loop what is this specific framework etc etc right and that's where tinkering really really helps but it becomes a little bit more it becomes harder the more abstract and high level things get. I even go as far as to say that some things are so abstract and so high level, especially if you want to see high level shit, go and try to look at anything produced in terms of tech talks by like these high end thought leader architect types, where they just conceptualize entire ways of thinking about software where in my opinion, personally, some of it is so high level that I really only think that it makes sense in their mind. And the people who think that they understand it don't actually understand it. They're just kind of in, they just get swooped away with the presentation. Uh, or maybe it's just that I'm stupid. I don't know. Anywho, uh, that's the other thing, which is much more difficult, where you're talking about philosophies or, you know, mindsets and ways of thinking, uh, more abstract things. And when you're challenged with that sort of uh, information, it's very hard to tinker with that, if that makes sense. This is where I argue the truly gifted people make themselves known. And I'm not talking just, ex se 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 I don't think about seniors here. I'm talking about the people who make the future, the people who are the people who, in, who really create the next thing and so forth. Because I believe that they, these people have the ability to capture 
what is in essence experience and a, and a viewpoint from someone who is usually fairly intelligent in these sorts of books and so forth and pull that together to and formulate an, an idea of a new concept or something that they could create like in basically an, an inventor because these things are so high at level and some of them are just thoughts from people f that have sh f faced different challenges in their life there's nothing you know beyond there's nothing concrete made in this area and then they figure out that you know what I have all of these sorts of problems that very f well fits into this very very abstract thought this person is expressing in their book and you know based on my experiences it would be really cool if we had a solution that sort of captures this ideology or this way of thinking or this whatever it is right and actually it fits into this sort of use case to solve this category of problems it's the it's something that is as i said it's it's not something that you can, you, you, like, when you get to that point, you, you can't just go and tinker immediately. You actually have to do some serious uh, reflection to be able to do this, which I think is, uh, and then you go and tinker. Like the tinkering is always there, in my opinion. Like tinkering, you always end up with tinkering. And this is what I argue, like theoretical scientists and so forth, that's what the Hadron Collider and all this came from, because it started out as basically math. And then you get further and further into your understanding of the problem until you get so far ahead in it that you actually, you know what? We can start making this into the real world now. We don't have to just have it on paper. We can actually create something physical with it. And that is the other way. It's still tinkering at the end of the day, but it takes a lot of processing. And so in that scenario, when I read books like that, an example of such a book would be... Uh, I had there was or rather there was not a good it wasn't just a book it was a it was an amazing presentation on the problem of distributed systems and data consistency across systems by it was a tech talk I can't remember now who it was but his, this guy had had done exactly this it was a beautiful beautiful piece of it was the most elegant thing I've ever seen he had basically stated that the event sourcing idea of which is basically just a way for you to solve a different sort of problem it's not really this, uh, intended per se to solve the problem of consistency between the nodes in a distributed system it's something that is designed in order for you to maintain data traceability and a few other benefits as well. So, I mean, I'm a big fan of uh, event sourcing under the right circumstances. But we, he made the argument that he had realized that one of the problems with data consistency between nodes in a, in a distributed system is that when you're dispatching messages, it's a push system usually. Now, the problem with the push-based system is that if you lose a message somewhere, it's you, you immediately lose your consistency. In a pull-based system, there's a different sort of problem because in a traditional database structure, you actually just mutate the existing record as is. You don't keep a history of how all the changes that you make to whatever entities you keep in your database. But event sourcing does that. In other words, if you use an event sourcing only system in a pull-based approach to figuring out like uh, changes in a system like f f getting messages, you're actually always guaranteed that even if something goes wrong with the network or something doesn't really work out, you can always trace back. You always have the history. You don't have to have one gigantic message bus, which you should, in, if you've ever done this at large scale, you know how big that message bus can get. Because each database is its own message bus, if that makes sense. So it's its own ledger of all the things that has actually changed within the system. And that I thought was, this was an example of what I'm talking about. He had understood the essence of the ideas, like the philosophical ideas of event sourcing, some of the problems that we have in the distributed system, and he had tied that together into a personal experiment. And he basically had made this very simple system. I actually, I think I actually have a video where I tried to do the same thing. Like he has, he showed me, showed like a very high level, oh, this is sort of theoretically how it could work. And then I created my own little implementation of it. And it's the, it, 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 I think it worked pretty well, uh, but that's the sort of uh, other way that you can go about uh, learning how to, uh, how to apply things that you read in a programming book. Because some things are so high level that you can't really just sit down and tinker immediately as you can with simpler things like CSS or 
you know, a new tool or something like that, because that's like almost you just you need to learn how this thing works. Sometimes you just have to sit down and really think about the problem and just reflect. And then if something comes to you, like if you get an insight or you get inspired, then you can go and sit and tinker with it. But it's still tinkering. So what I want you to take away from this is that the way that I apply what I read in programming books is tinker, 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 always. Always be experimenting, always do small little mini projects, throw them away if you don't like them, try them out. Just, you know, if you go check my GitHub repo, it's like hundreds of projects now. And it's like not even half of them. I would say maybe one or two of them are something that I would just show up and say, this I thought was pretty nice. And everything else is like cringeworthy where my eyes would water if I had to sit and walk you through what I did here. Uh, so, and it's because it's not about making I argue at the very least to be a good software developer to do anything to be good at anything optimize for experimentation to try small things out to try to you know don't try to make one big thing that is perfect to learn that you can do if you're going to ship something or you're going to make something for somebody else that's a different thing but for your own personal learning it's better to read a little bit and sort of reflect and think about okay how did this work okay this is sort of how they said it was going to work okay let me just write some stuff here and see what that happens we'll see what happens and that's it just repeat that because that is in the heart and soul of the scientific method and it is the thing that I argue has brought us to where we are right now and it's the future it's the, the most consistent method that uh, humans have to evolve uh, I believe at the very least have a great day